We'll pick it up on the 13th verse of 2 Thessalonians. Before we get started, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Most loving Father, once again, we come before thy mighty presence this morning, thanking you for another wonderful, joyous, and blessed day that we've had. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for your Son, Jesus, who made all these things possible. He causes us to wake up in the morning to see the beautiful sun and the warmth that it gives to us and also the coolness of the night. We thank you for the safety that you give to us, dear Heavenly Father, and the health that we enjoy. We ask that you may continue to help us, lead us this morning and finding those wonderful words that you have spoken to us through the prophets, that we may understand them and walk in the light as your son walks in the light as well. We thank you, dear God, and we ask that you will put a special blessing on each and every one of us, a joyful blessing, and be with those who could not make it this morning. For all these things we ask in Christ's holy name. Amen. Okay, <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians, second chapter. And we talked real briefly on verse 12. Remember we talked about that? Verse 12 says, If that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his, king, into his own kingdom with, and glory. We talked about that and I gave you a lot of scriptures on that. And uh, it is God who calls and it is up to a man either to accept it or reject his calling. And we talked about that. And uh, we talked about those who accept the gospel must walk according to the gospel. We talked about that last Sunday. How one has to walk in a newness of life. Walk in faith and not by sight. And also walk in the spirit. Walk in love. And also walk in the light. We talked about that. I gave you scriptures on that. And now <clears throat> we're going back, we're going forward to verse 13. Now verse 13 says this, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, and not as the word of men, but as the word of truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So here Paul, in this particular passage, and this is actually, there's no other, there's no other passage in the New Testament which actually reaffirms more than this. The fact that Paul shows a gospel to, that it was in divine origin and not any precepts by man. And he also talks about always thanking God, never ceasing, but always thank him for everything that we have. He even told the, Thess the Ephesians in 1, 15 through 16, and he writes to them, he says, give thanks without ceasing. All the time, give thanks. And this is one of the things that we actually put in our prayers thanking him for everything that we have, thanking him for the food that we eat, thanking him for the clothes that we wear, thanking him for Christ who made all these things possible. Always thank him. And this is what uh, Paul was telling them. It's, it's actually, it, it's good to actually think about the things that God has given us. And you know, many times people don't, you know, they take things for granted. But I always thank God for giving me a life a life of joy in spite of all the circumstances that we have to go through, but he still gives us a life of joy. And this is what the Thessalonians were experiencing. In spite of all the persecutions that they were having, they were filled with joy, love, and they were walking by faith and not by sight. So, if we don't thank God every day, we're going to miss out and what God gives us and becomes a habit. 
when we don't thank God. We thank our spouses for giving us something, a present or whatever the case may be. Children thank us for many things. We thank our parents. But we should give thanks to God always. Always thank God for everything. And like I said, even if you're sick, thank him. Like the Thessalonians, they were struggling, they were persecuted. And they still gave thanks to God. So this is one of the most important passages that we need to, to actually put in our minds. Thank God for everything that he's given us. <clears throat> and so, as we move on to 14 through 15, for you, brethren, became imitators of the church of God, which are in Judea, and Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they do not please God, and are contrary to all men. Verse 16, forbidding to us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved so as always to fill up the measure of their sins with wrath has become upon them to the uttermost. Now, verse 13, believing the believing Jews, the unbelieving Jews, I should say, were a greater deterrent, a greater threat to the gospel than the heathens or the pagans. They were a greater threat. Their own brothers, their own countrymen, the unbelieving Jews, they were the instigators, the troublemakers. And this was evident in, 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 in Thessalonica as well. It was evidence in Paul's day. It was evidence when Jesus was here. These Jews were just terrible trying to stop the gospel from being spread. As I said, they were worse than the pagans. And you can imagine the problems they had, how the Jews just tried to hinder the gospel from being spread. Terrible. Verse 15 says, contrary to all men, means that in their efforts to stop the gospel being preached, they sought to keep anyone from reaching eternal salvation. Everything. Mike? Chapter 2, verses 13, or excuse me, 14 to 15. You got that? Huh? Oh, I said, yeah, well, is that what I said? Second Thessalonians? I said first Thessalonians second chapter. Is that what I said? Verse fourteen through fifteen. I did, huh? Well, first Thessalonians second chapter. I'm sorry if I got you guys mixed up. You got that? You guys got that already? Is everybody in the right chapter, right verse? Okay. So as I said, 14 and 15, the unbelieving Jews were a greater threat, okay, in spreading the gospel. They wanted to stop it. And you know, today a lot of people want to stop it. I was watching one of the uh, worldwide uh, debates on TV. You got the Church of Christ debating with denominational people. And they were debating on the fact that the denominational people said that you don't have to be baptized even though chapters uh, Peter, uh, after Acts 2.38 tells you because it says they wanted to turn the whole, uh, the whole verse to favor them and take out certain things out of that particular verse. 
And the debate was, just read it, see what Jesus is saying, what, Peter's, uh, what Peter is saying to the people, repent and be baptized. And they were saying, you can repent, but because you can be baptized, and because you can be baptized, they put this because in there, they say, you were already saved, so why be baptized? Same thing with Paul, it's so confusing. Same thing with Paul as he was saying, okay, excuse me, Don. When Paul was saying, when he was for three days couldn't see, Ananias comes and he says, Brother Ananias, stop. The, dem the denominational people say, he was a brother already, so he was already saved because he was a brother. So you see how they confuse the people around, Dan? If we follow Christ's teaching, uh huh. That's right. And but see, here's the thing. They understand that. But the thing of it is, is this. When Paul, when Ananias told Paul, why tearest thou, brother, arise and be baptized? They use that word brother already as part of being saved. Isn't that terrible? And I could not believe what they were talking about, how they can twist the scriptures. And I said before, I think it was last Sunday, I said, all people are related to one another from creation, but not all are related to what? Through redemption. So these people don't know what they're talking about. And yet their churches are bulging with people. So that if you can say, so the Jews here, you can, you can figure the Jews, how they hated the gospel. They tried to stop it from going any further because they wanted their own religion, which was uh, the Old Testament religion. So as verse, verse 15 says, who killed both the Lord Jesus Christ and their own prophets have perversed us and they do not please God and are contrary to all men. Contrary to all men means that they, their efforts to stop the gospel being preached, they sought to keep anyone from salvation. These were the worst people that you can deal with. And as I mentioned, the Thessalonians had all this. They were being persecuted. This was greed and envy of the worst of that particular time. Not only did they not themselves obey the gospel, but they tried to keep others from coming to Christ. Someone turn to Matthew 23, 13. 23.13. It's good if you read the whole chapter of 23 of Matthew, but we're just going with 1.13. Pharisees and scribes. You know, the scribes were the lawyers. They were the main body, okay? And Christ says, woo to you who try to stop the gospel. These were troublemakers. They killed Jesus on the cross. They stoned the prophets, as Matthew 23, 37 says. And here they try to hinder the, the gospel from being spread. You know, when you go to other parts of the country, you, you, sometimes it's impossible to take your Bible with you, your Bible. And if you do, you better be careful and not get arrested. Verse 16. 
forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved as though, as, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath, is, is kept, but wrath has come upon them in the uttermost. I believe the verse 15 and 16, Paul had in mind the coming of the siege of the destruction of Jerusalem because their time was near and they were going to be consumed. They were going to be killed. And so, these Jews who killed the prophets and killed the Son of God, now they were trying to kill the gospel. How could they measure up with their sins? How could they measure up to a greater degree? Wrath was going to come upon them. Literally means the end of these people. The wrath was going to come upon them. They're dead. They're gone. But they're suffering in a place called temporary torment until the judgment day. So these people were terrifying people, ugly people, ugly because of the behavior that they were having against the gospel. You know when they killed Jesus, when they wanted to kill him? We have no God, we have Caesar. And when Pilate put a, a little sign above the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, don't put that. Don't put that. He's not our king. Even in, in his death, they still try to control everything. And today, they're still trying to control things, too. Not only certain parts of the world with their own religion, but even here. So we have a big job ahead of us. False churches are always bulging with people. Always bulging. You see them when you come to work. You see all these cars parked all over the parking lots there. Why is that so? Because they make it easy for one person to make it to heaven without baptism. All you got to do is say the sinner's prayer. Say, God, forgive me, but I will follow you for the rest of my life. You are my personal savior. And that's the way it is. They take all their baggage, all their attitudes when they pass on. They still take him with them to the grave and to a place called temporary torment. Verse 17. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. An equivalent expression here, extreme love, Paul felt for the church at Thessalonica. Paul loved the church so much that he was willing to actually make all kinds of sacrifices for himself in reaching the highest level of affection. 1 Thessalonians 2 and 8. He was so glad to see the church really blossom. It's like I said, in spite of the circumstances that they were going through, because chapter 3 tells us, of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, tells us that in spite of all their persecutions that they were suffering, they were full of joy. So Paul was really glad 
to hear that they were really doing a good job. You know, when, when the church does a wonderful job for Christ and for mankind, don't you think that there's joy in heaven? Don't you think that God in Christ is satisfied, is glad to see the church full of love for one another? That's how, that's how Paul felt. Verse 18, Therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. Satan always tries and does, he hinders us. Just what Satan, in the way of hindering Paul, we don't know. It's unknown. One has to be aware that Satan never sleeps, 1 Peter 5 and 8. He's always out there, testing us to see if we're going to fall. You know, Paul could easily say, well, uh, Satan hinders us, that's okay. I'm used to that. You know, sometimes Satan hinders you from doing something that you should do. But you've got to wait for another time to do it. It's amazing how Satan can actually penetrate your heart when you drop all your armor and you go out naked without your armor. The devil is ready to, to touch your heart with evil. So we have to be ready to have the full body armor of God. Sleep with it, wake up with it, Come to worship with it. Because Satan never sleeps. Verse 19 and 20. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his, at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. For what is, for what is it? Paul said, for what is it that we live for? What is it that we live for that gives us hope and joy? The fact that we should stand together before God when he comes again. For, we, for actually we are always in our glory and in our joy. You know, it's hard to be joyful sometimes, isn't it? Of all the things that are going on in the world, all the things that are happening to you, visiting doctors and doing this and doing that and getting older and you can't get around and, and some people just become depressed, not joyful. But it doesn't make any difference how old we get or how uh, weak we may be. We should still be joyful in the fact that we have a reward at the end. That's what we're all looking for, a reward. And Paul says, you are our glory and our joy. Paul was so excited with the church. But he says, you are our glory and joy when we hear about you standing firm. It was something that Paul was just so happy to know that the church was flourishing. You know, I'm always happy to be here in the morning on Sundays. I tell, I tell my wife, oh, I wish Sunday would just be around here, just around the corner so I can just go back and, and, and study and, and read and, and teach and be with the fellowship. 
It gives me great joy. I don't think I could stay home on a Sunday unless I'm dead. When I was having my, what to call a proton therapy because of my prostate and, and Loma Linda, I'd be, I was here every Sunday. Every Sunday. We'd stay up there. We come home on Saturdays, wash our clothes, get ready for worship service on Sunday, and go back Sunday evening, back to my therapy. Did that for 48 days. This was my calling. I couldn't stay away. I could easily tell my wife, ah, let's do something else. Let's don't go to worship, sir. Let's do this. Let's do that. No. That's my calling. I'm sure glad I'm doing it. Chapter 13. You know, Paul sent Timothy to check on the Thessalonians. He knew I know if they were strengthened in the midst of their persecution. So he said, Timothy. And he reminds them that they should actually expect suffering because of their faith in Christ Jesus. Timothy writes back to them, to Paul, reported that the Thessalonians are thriving despite of their persecution. They're full of glory, full of joy. They're thriving. And boy, that comforted Paul. Listen to verse 3, chapters 3 and verse 1 and 2. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left, to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, to our fellow laborers of the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. Verse 3, that no one should be shaken by these affections, afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. So, we is, is, is to be understood as Silas and Timothy were left in Berea. Paul, sent, Paul was in Athens in, in Acts 17, 14 through 15. And he sends Timothy to check on the Thessalonians. The church was at its youth. All Timothy could do on the way of encouragement and comfort would be of much value toward attaining spiritual maturity. Timothy had a big job on his hands. When Paul says, I want you to go to Thessalonica, check on those brothers. See what you can do. Encourage them. Watch over them. Let them know that we are praying for them without ceasing. And so Timothy goes there, and he reports back to Paul. In verse 3, the term afflictions could mean the afflictions suffered by Paul and his fellow workers. Trials and persecution would come to the church at Thessalonica. We all have trials. We all have persecutions. Every church of Christ has suffered. Suffered some form of persecution. There's always literature against the church of Christ that Christ established. People always talk about it negatively. Remember one time I came to Apple Valley a few years back. Because this gentleman told me that his sister wanted to learn more about the gospel. I drove all the way to Apple Valley in the evening. 
And we sat down. I was so excited. And I was teaching her about the book of Acts because that's where the church starts. It's the Acts of the Apostles. And as we go into baptism, she says, you know, let's stop for a minute. She says, I go see Billy Graham all the time. She says, I've gone to Las Vegas, I've gone to San Bernardino, Los Angeles, every place that he appears and preaches, I go there. He's a wonderful preacher. And uh, I've been saved so many times. And I said, well, I said, can you explain that to me? How have you been saved? Well, you know, we, he tells us there, you know. We all pray the sinner's prayer. We all go forward, raise our hands and everything, you know, and it makes me feel good. And I said, you know, even Billy Graham says, I have never baptized anybody. Never baptized anybody. And he says, and I said, what, what you're doing is an error. The Bible doesn't teach that. Then we went into a debate, and she got, she got so heated up that she says, I don't want to study with you anymore. Goodbye. So I left. But you see how these big preachers, Billy Graham had real good lessons, real good sermons. But at the end, he doesn't teach about baptism. He says, come forward and pray to God for salvation. It's very hard to teach an individual. But it seems that these false teachers, their attempt toward apostatizing these people, those at Thessalonica, they were actually causing all kinds of trouble. And Paul says, we are appointed to this. We know we're going to have persecutions. We know we're going to be persecuted. In verse 4, we included ourselves, he says. All Christians suffer afflictions in one way or the other. We all suffer in one way or another. But because we suffer, is that going to hinder us from loving Christ? Is that going to hinder us from coming to the worship service and taking communion? It shouldn't. But it does hinder many people. The church was suffering because false teaching and persecution was there, and Paul predicted this, this situation. You know, when I became baptized... You know what the elder told me? You're not going to have friends anymore. Not the friends that you're hanging around with. Those are just acquaintances. But you're going to have brothers and sisters in Christ. I couldn't understand that. Why, why my friends, I couldn't see my friends anymore. It's not that you couldn't see your friends. They just didn't want to see you anymore. I couldn't understand that. It just doesn't take overnight. It takes a, a, quite a long time before you realize what's going on. When you're a member of the Lord's body, you won't have too many friends, only your brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember when my wife got baptized? She was so glad, so joyous, so happy. That when she went to work, she told the people, I was baptized. Where were you baptized? Church of Christ. Oh, you shouldn't have done that. That is the worst place to go. She comes all bewildered. This is what they told me. I says, what do we say all along? As soon as you're baptized, the devil comes right in there and tries to take that word right out of your heart. And that's what they're doing. Hang in there. Thank God we hanged in there. But you see all the suffering that we have to go through?
Even my own sister told me, well, who's teaching you? Well, Brother Lauren Thompson, oh, don't even, oh, don't even talk to that man. You know what they tell me what happens? He's at work, at work, you know. He says, he steals all kinds of tools. Rumors, just rumors. I owe my life to Brother Lorne Thompson for saving me in Christ Jesus, teaching me to hang in there. These Christians in Thessalonica, they knew already what Paul was talking about. They knew the things that Paul was saying. Paul suffered, you should suffer too. And they accepted it. We accept it. Listen to verse 5. What was that? Verse 4, I'm sorry. Well, verse 4. In fact, we told you before when we were with you, that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened, and you know. And that's exactly what it's talking about. Paul included himself and all the Christians who have to suffer all the time. In verse 5, for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent, I sent, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be vain. The devil knows how to send fierce trials to everybody. He knows exactly what to do upon the children of God. As I said, he never sleeps. He always tempts us in our behavior, in our talk, when we argue. We lose control, our tongue just uncontrollable, as James tells us. He knows exactly how to push our buttons. And when he does that, little by little, we separate ourselves from Christ. The devil knows, and he sends these fiery trail trials upon us all the time. And Paul sent Timothy to find out whether their faith was still strong. Timothy reports back, yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's strong. Paul was afraid that perhaps Satan would get the best of them. And cause some of them to leave the church. But they didn't. They stood firm. And that's what we ought to do. We do. We should. Always. Stand firm in spite of the circumstances. In spite of persecution. In spite of whatever Satan throws at us. We cannot let him take over our lives. That's why these stories, these letters, how they can encourage us. If they encourage the church there, where they had a lot of persecution, certainly we can be encouraged here. These people were just full of joy. Listen to verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love and that you are always, that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also see you. Timothy brought good news to Paul that their faith, their love, was strong. Boy, that comforted Paul. That made Paul very happy. 
And the church remembered their visit with joy and wanted to see Paul again. And Paul wanted to see them as well. They were full of joy, both of them. You know, when Paul sent for the elders in Miletus from Miletus, and Paul tells him, tells the elders in so many words, you will not see my face anymore. And the elders felt so sorry that they grabbed him, they held on to him, they kissed him in the neck because they didn't want to let go of Paul. You will not see my face anymore. But Paul was glad to hear that these people in Thessalonica were doing great works for the Lord. They were working, they were faithful, they loved each other. In spite of the persecution that they had, they stood firm. And Paul saw this, saw this through Timothy with the letter. Oh man, he was so glad, so glad. Let's remember these people, how they reacted to the persecution. Remember our attitudes and persecutions too. Paul said, whatever the circumstances I may find myself to be, I find myself to be content. Content. And that's what these people were demonstrating. Contentment, faithfulness, joy. Oh, I love those words. I always love the church. I'll always love it. Because God gave me life through Christ Jesus. Any final comments? Yes, Lori. Sure. Exactly. You kind of wonder how they're doing, huh? Yes. Also. You know, I have the same feeling. I had a lot of friends that left. They live in Tennessee. Some live in Florida, Oklahoma. And Mike and Elaine, they usually call us from Oklahoma. And these are the people that we want to see so bad, but I know that they're doing good because they're worshiping Christ as well. Oh, yes, I'd sure like to go see them. I even told Betty, one of these days, I'd just like to get in the plane and just go visit all these people that we knew. I'd like to do that, see how they're doing. That's a good uh, comment, Lori. Any other questions? Dan? I just wanted to address the, the big churches and the false teachings. And we do need to stand firm with the word of God. That's right. Because in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, enter by the narrow gate. That's right. We need to stand firm. Yeah. What did... Uh, There's only going to be a few of us to find the way. That's right. And it's not going to be easy. What did, uh, what did Delbert say about the Broadway? He called it the Broadway Church. Yeah. Don't ever go to the Broadway Church. You know, because it's broad, it's wide, where many are entering. And you see it. You see it all over. In fact, on 7th Street, there's a place that was called the Burning Bush. Big old letters and cars. I mean, it just, whoo, my goodness. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but you see how false teaching attracts many people? And true teaching does not attract many people. Right. They want to hear, they want the, you, you know, they want to have fun. They want to do this and want to do that. But you can't do that in the church. You can have fun. There you go. Thank you very much. Appreciate your attendance.